How fast can a Formula One car go? What is the top speed of a Grand Prix car in the current generation? This is a question that comes up absolutely all of the time, and I think we should endeavour to answer it, considering we have the Mexican Grand Prix this weekend. And why does the Mexican Grand Prix matter? Well, it is the place where the highest top speed of any Grand Prix car was recorded back in 2016 by this man, Valtteri Bottas in the Mercedes-powered Williams. Now that car set a top speed of 372.5 kph during that race. Now a lot of people are going to be mentioning another moment during that season and I'll come to that in a minute but first of all I just want to explain we're going to be talking about all of these top speeds in kph kilometers per hour rather than mph just because all of the data that we've got outputs into kph into metric units but just for reference 200 miles an hour is 322 kph and you'll probably be able to work out the other numbers as we go through its uh, various converters online now the other moment i was referring to was this at the azerbaijan grand prix in 2016 and elsewhere on the f1 youtube channel you can find a video recording this as the highest top speed ever recorded on a Grand Prix weekend. Valtteri Bottas once again in the Williams getting into the toe of a Red Bull and a Ferrari in front of it and hitting a top speed of 378 kph. But there is some uncertainty about that top speed and when it was recorded. The team initially said yeah 378 it was the fastest time the fastest speed we've ever seen in Formula One but they later retracted that and said, well, in fact, that might have been a little bit of a glitch in the data, and it was, in fact, that moment at the Mexican Grand Prix that saw the highest top speed. So, a little bit of a debate over whether it was Mexico or Azerbaijan, but it was certainly Valtteri Bottas in the Williams. But in the current generation of car, things have changed slightly. We've had a much larger amount of hybridization of the cars and the new regulations that are introduced at the 2022 season. Very different looking and better looking cars, quite frankly. And the highest speed we've seen in this generation of car is from this man, Yuki Tsunoda, who set a time of 360 kph on the very last lap of last year's Belgian Grand Prix, getting a monster toe off the back of that Haas. And that is the fastest time we have seen in the current generation of Formula One car. I do suspect though, that record is gonna change pretty soon. Now, there have been a few questions about some of these top speeds. We talk about it on Tech Talk quite a lot. We've talked about it in commentary quite a lot on F1 Live as well. Why do the speed trap times that you might see at the end of each sector or the speed trap around the lap differ to the top speeds that we quote? And it's all to do with the way that the current generation of car achieve their top speed. Because depending on the, the car, the power unit map, or even the setup and the driver, they all actually achieve their top speeds at different points around the circuit. And we can see that a little bit with this uh, data trace from Lando Norris in qualifying for the Italian Grand Prix at Monza. Now, take a look at the end of the straights along here. You can see the McLaren is starting to decelerate before the end of the straight. I'm exaggerating it slightly with the yellow lines here, but you can see it quite clearly. The car is slowing down before the driver has reached the end of the straight. Now, is he lifting off the throttle? Well, you can see the throttle trace right down here, and you can see Norris pretty much is full throttle, well, 100% full throttle, yet the car is slowing down. In the different sections of, lap, of the lap, you can see the DRS is wide open. It's not the DRS shutting and the drag effects of the DRS slowing the car down. This is a characteristic of these hybrid cars. They run out of power, run out of energy before the end of the straight. And you can see it sometimes on race coverage when you've got the graphics on the onboard cameras. You can see the car starting to decelerate ever so slightly before the driver hits the brake and shuts the DRS. And you can see those points around this lap of Monza very clearly on Norris's lap. He is starting to decelerate before the corner. And these points change for each driver, each lap and each car, as I say. So. It means the trap speeds that you might see recorded at the end of each sector or on the official speed trap around the lap, it may not be at the fastest point of the lap, which is why we rely on the GPS data and the data off the cars themselves to give you the figures that we give you in commentary and here on Tech Talk. So we are going to be talking only about the real top speeds of the cars. 
And it is quite interesting because when you come into this year's top speeds, let's have a look at the fastest two circuits we've been to of this season so far. Azerbaijan was quite interesting this year because the speeds weren't as high as normal. But when we get to the Belgian Grand Prix, we can only rely on dry weather data, but you normally see the highest speeds in the race anyway because you get more toes, the cars running closer together than they would do in qualifying because they're battling for position. And the fastest car at, uh, at Spa is no great surprise. There you go. It's the Williams of Alex Albon. But I think what I think is a bit more interesting is this chart shows how those speeds are made up. Take a look down at the McLaren, the slowest car in straight in terms of straight line speed at spa it's got a baseline speed so running in clean air of just 310 kph give it a bit of a toe somebody sits in front of it gets another nine kph and then the rest of it is made up here the bulk of that speed is made up with the drs so the wing opens up and the car whizzes off down the straight and different cars you can see have different amounts of drs effect the ferrari you see didn't have a very big DRS effect at Spa, according to this data, whereas the Aston Martin had a whopping amount of DRS effect. So it's the different car designs, again, producing their times and producing their speed in a different way. Then you get to Monza, uh, the fastest circuit we've been to so far. And actually, I was quite surprised to see it's actually Mercedes with the highest speed so far of the season, 359 kph i did think we were going to see a few drivers nudging past that 360 kph record but it didn't happen even with some great battles on track and you can see here some of the teams didn't get a huge toe effect which is quite surprising but the nature of monza is all the cars are running as skinny as possible and trying to get down the straight as quick as possible just a little mention here of alpine who i thought were really down on performance in monza with drs they weren't looking too bad at all. But when you look at their Alpine's baseline speed, just 323 kph down the straights at Monza. Look back at their top speeds in Belgium, just 322. So the Alpine looks like it might be an inherently draggy design, but has really effective DRS. So that could be a characteristic of that car. But when we come to Mexico City, the high altitude has a big factor to play. You'll see the cars all running Hungarian Grand Prix style packages, aerodynamic packages. So big high downforce wings and big brake ducts, things like that, big cooling packages. And that's all because the track sits nearly two and a half kilometers above sea level. That very thin air, 16% oxygen at that height, 21% oxygen at sea level. It's a big difference in terms of performance for the car aerodynamically and also for the car's cooling packages, which is why if you go to Monza, this is the Mercedes at Monza this year, you'll see really flat, very low drag rear wings, very small upper element, very, very small upper element here. And you can just see that car whizzing down the straight, trying to achieve its top speed that way. With the thin air in Mexico, the Mercedes is running pretty much the same sort of speeds down the straight, but much bigger wings because that thin air, they need to use a much bigger wing to generate any sort of downforce through the twisty bits of the circuit. Now, high altitude doesn't just mean big wings, big downforce, as I mentioned, it means big cooling packages. Take a look at the Haas. This is the upgraded car just last week at Austin. And you can see this section of the car really blanked off, not much cooling in terms of outlets there. You can see a few bits that are coming out and we detailed this car quite extensively just last week. So you can check that out elsewhere on this channel. But have a look at the Haas when we get to Mexico. It's louvres everywhere. It looks like an old 1970s wardrobe. There's so many louvres all over it. All of that cooling, they're just desperately trying to keep that Ferrari power unit, all those Ferrari components underneath the bodywork cool and just opened up the car as much as possible because the thin air, that lack of air density means that the drag penalty for running a car as open as this is much, much smaller than it would be at Monza. If you ran a package like this at Monza, you would be so, so slow down the straight. So you would never see a package like this on the car. Then take a look at the rear of the Alpha Tauri. Similar story. This is the Monza package. The car runs at very high speed, lots of air under the bodywork, sea level racing essentially. And you've got this very small opening at the back of the car. That's all where all of the air is coming out of the engine cover then take a look at the package they're running in mexico you could get lost in there it's so big huge openings all under there as the team's desperately trying to evacuate heat from underneath the engine cover and it's all about just that drag level that thin air means you can get a very high top speed 
for a very small drag penalty, you can run all of this cooling and it still doesn't really hamper you because the penalty for a lot of drag just isn't gonna hurt. The, car, the cars are accelerating all the way to the end of the straight. But top speed isn't everything in Formula One. It's a lovely number to talk about. And yes, it helps drivers like Alex Albon do lots of overtaking. We saw that very clearly in Monza and at the Canadian Grand Prix earlier this year. But I was talking to a NASCAR engineer about this just a few years ago. And he was telling me that when you compare a Formula One car and how it makes its lap time and a NASCAR stock car around the high banks of Daytona or Talladega running flat out all the way around the circuit, one of those IndyCar or NASCAR type arrangements is really purity of engineering. The car just needs to run at top speed all the way around the lap and they don't have to worry too much about braking and the car just needs to be stable in the pack through corners. This NASCAR engineer described Formula One as being a ballet of compromise and I thought that was a beautiful way to describe how you get an F1 car to go around a lap as quickly as possible. A Formula One lap isn't just left-hand corners and banked corners, it's got left-hand corners, fast corners, slow corners, turning left and right and that is that ballet of compromise. You need a car that works all the way around the lap and not just at top speed, but it is fun to look at.